Привет, меня зовут Элиас. Добро пожаловать на мой канал. Ladies and gentlemen, today we return. I'm going to start doing more cartoons from the Soviet era. Mainly gonna probably do them on Boosty due to copyright issues on YouTube. So I will start with this YouTube video of a beginner's guide to Soviet animated cinema. We'll see what I can learn and then I will leave a link to the first boosty cartoon from the Soviet era that I will have to post there. It will be behind the paywall to so we'll kind of hide from copyright. So for those who want to subscribe to the boosty link in description. Let's get started. Just about the beginning of the Soviet Union in 1922. The nation had a rich and vibrant animation industry that produced some of the best animation in the world. Soviet animation spans all genres and ranges from films meant for children to surreal, violent, or disturbing material intended for adults. Most of it oh, is wow. pretty obscure to non-Russians, but it still had substantial influence on global animation. The first time period I'll cover in this video is when Joseph Stalin was in power from 1922 to 1953. The earliest surviving animation from the USSR is Soviet Toys from 1924. 1924? A very important Soviet filmmaker known for his 1929 experimental documentary, Man with a Movie Camera. Soviet Toys, like a lot of animation from the era, looks pretty crude by today's standards and features basic black and white line drawings. It's not aimed at children, but it's still pretty silly and has an over-the-top caricature of a bloated capitalist. Also from 1924 is Interplanetary Revolution, a bizarre science fiction using cutout animation. Like a lot of very early Soviet animation, it was unmistakably propaganda and depicted capitalists being driven off the planet to Mars. The eight minute film uses a constructivist style, which was a Russian art movement that emphasized simple geometric shapes and made unambiguous propaganda. In 1925, a half-hour cutout animation titled China in Flames was released, an explicitly political and unsubtle propaganda that shows how the imperialists and landlords are destroying China, also using over-the-top caricatures of capitalists. One of the animators on China in Flames was a man dubbed the Patriarch of Soviet Animation, Ivan Ivanov Vano. His directorial debut was Senka the African, the first Soviet animation meant for children. The 1920s also saw the beginnings of an equally seminal directing duo called the Grandmothers of Soviet Animation, the Broomberg Sisters, Valentina and Zinaida. Their earliest surviving film is Samoyed Boy from 1928, with the oh. title referring to an obsolete term for an indigenous group in Siberia. It includes polar bears and reindeer, and unsurprisingly, given Russia's geographic location, a lot of future Soviet animation would feature Arctic animals. In 1934, the sisters co-directed The history for the animation of the Soviet era is so vast. We're only two and a half minutes in. Crazy. The Tale of Tsar Durandai with Ivan Ivanovano, and it was the first of many Soviet animated films adapted from a classic fairy tale. The career of yet another crucial animation director began in 1929 with a short called Post by Mikhail Sekhanovsky. It also uses cutouts and a constructivist style. However, Post is not overtly political and instead tells a story about the Postal Service. One of the most important films of this early Soviet era was The New Gulliver, directed by Alexander Petushko. Using puppets, it was feature-length at 75 minutes long and the first feature-length stop-motion animated film ever made. The success of all these films. Wow, as well I always as thought Japan were the first Disney guys that, that did this animation. The Moscow Festival devoted to American animation led in 1936 to the creation of a studio dedicated to animation called Soyuz Multfilm. It was founded in Moscow and still produces animation today. Yeah, I was going to say they the still use this today. There was a significant increase in the sophistication and number of films made. Many of them used an animation technique known as rotoscoping where live-action footage is traced over frame by frame, allowing for more realistic-looking movement. These films also had a heavy influence from Disney, and many were adaptations of fairy tales and folk tales. The Broomberg sisters directed several films during these decades for Soyuz Molt film based on fairy or folk tales, like Little Red Riding Hood, Puss in Boots, and Baba Yaga. In the mid-40s, their films started to get longer and near-feature length, 
such as the 35-minute The Tale of Tsar Sultan, based on a fairy tale by the founder of modern Russian literature, Alexander Pushkin. In 1945, they directed The Lost Letter, adapted from an 1831 short story about Ukrainian Cossacks by Nikolai Gogol, another one of the most important Russian writers. They again drew from Gogol's stories in 1951 with The Night Before Christmas, what? That is from 1951? Look at the quality! Ivan Ivanovano continued to direct as well during the 30s and 40s. Guys, any films that you see here that you recognize that are good, leave some in the comments, alright? I want to see what the masses are thinking. Most notably with 1947's Humpbacked Horse. Produced by Soyuz Film, it was in color and almost an hour. It was an interpretation of a famous Russian fairy tale poem from the 19th century and the whole thing is narrated in rhyme. There was even some animation being produced outside of Moscow, like director Lev Adamanov, who worked at Armen Film Studio in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia. He made the first Armenian sound animation Dog and Cat, which was derived from an Armenian poem. He eventually went to work for Soyuz Molt Film, directing the fully rotoscoped and 40 minute long Scarlet Flower in 1952. Stalin died in 1953, and Nikita Khrushchev took over from then until 1964. This time was known as the Khrushchev Thaw due to a reduction in government censorship and repression, leading to much greater creative freedom for animators. The 1950s saw the height of the Soviet Union's traditionally animated films, and the most popular and successful was The Snow Queen, directed by Lev Adamanov and inspired by a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Besides The Snow Queen herself, most characters were not rotoscoped, and this was to give the queen an otherworldly feel, not for realism. The goal was to let the animators be more creative, and Adamanov thought the animation industry overused rotoscoping. The film won awards at multiple international festivals, and even got the unprecedented step of an American release, albeit with an entirely new soundtrack. The film was very well received in Japan as well. Even legendary anime director Hayao Miyazaki called the Snow Queen his favorite oh, wow. film and said it had a big influence on his decision to do animation as a career. The Broomberg yeah, sisters were he's also the guy that founded Studio time, Ghibli. making Flight to the Moon in 1953, the first Soviet animated science fiction in decades. In the early 1960s, Soviet... Damn, I had no idea the Soviets inspired animation worldwide, man. They have a lot of these accolades. I had no idea, man. I've only seen like maybe three Soviet cartoons. But none of these so far, but still, let's go. Soviet animation started moving away from the prevailing style into more experimental and adult-oriented material. This often meant simpler, more limited animation and a more formalist approach as opposed to straightforward realism. Perhaps the earliest example came from the Broomberg sisters in 1960, with a feature titled, It Was I Who Drew the Little Man. It was for children, but looks pretty different from films like The Snow Queen, as it had basic environments with backgrounds often just sketched out or sometimes just a solid color. It also doesn't contain rotoscoping. The Broomberg sisters continued this stylistic break the next year with The Great Troubles. Its intentional crudity is even farther from the technical sophistication Soviet animation had reached, and the style strongly resembles children's drawings. Another from 1961 was Lev Adamanov's The Key, which also had basic Hold on, let me see. Hold on. Okay, I couldn't see the, the film names. Actually sketched out environments. It had an odd combination of fantasy and sci-fi, with fairies, robots, and a teleportation machine. Also crucial to this artistic shift was the first film from director Fyodor Kitruk, Story of One Crime. Unlike the fairy tale adaptations that had been so popular in Soviet animation in preceding decades, this had a contemporary setting. Story of One Crime is definitely not intended for kids, as it's a Dostoevsky-esque psychological examination of what leads a man to murder. It oh, begins wow. with the clerk definitely beating two children. women to death with a frying pan, and then flashes back to show what led him to such extreme behavior. The short uses a much more flat, minimal style than the realism and naturalism that was found in the Disney-inspired earlier animation. There are few extraneous details, and movements of characters are abrupt rather than fluid. 
Soviet animators were still adapting fairy tales in the early 60s as well, with a notable film being The Wild Swans, co-directed by Mikhail Sekhanovsky and his wife Vera, and based on a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. The Wild Swans combines the flat stylized look with the more realistic Disney style. Humans move in a natural way, but almost always laterally and rarely in depth. Landscapes don't have a sense of perspective, and objects kind of just float against the plane in an unrealistic way. Other films worth mentioning of this period include The Millionaire, a story of a dog inheriting a fortune and becoming a congressman, and even Avano's highly creative cutout animation Left Hander. Кто бы мог подумать, что этот дом станет нашим спустя всего полгода? Те, кто переехал жить в Америку, нас сейчас The next era to cover is 1964 to 1982 when Leonid Brezhnev was in charge of the USSR. The technical and stylistic experimentation continued, now with influence from the new psychedelic movement, so things got even more bizarre and surreal. Like Kietrick with Story of One Crime, a director named Andrei Kirzhanovsky made satirical short films, with his first two both dealing with the bureaucracy. There lived Kozyavin from 1966, depicts a bureaucrat who, after being told to walk in a certain direction in the office by his boss, mindlessly takes the instruction to the extreme and walks around the entire world. His 1968 short, Glass Harmonica, was about the stifling of artistic freedom in a totalitarian society, and this was slipped past the censors by also including a message about the evils of money. Glass Harmonica is also pretty surreal and features grotesque creatures. Ooh, Fyodor Kietrich kept looks making style of free satirical shorts as well, and got in on mocking bureaucracy, such as in Man in the Frame, where a bureaucrat's narrow view of the world is represented by a literal frame he makes for himself to exist in. One of his most popular works is Film, Film, oh, Film. Oh, I've seen that one. I've seen that one. of the film production industry in the Soviet Union. It was a good film. Similarly to The Man in the Frame, it partly deals with the bureaucracy when it shows several different officials censoring the script and later that demanding true, a change yeah. to the ending after it's already filmed. However, it's a much more lighthearted film with lots of silly gags. Kietrich also made animation for children, such as his three adorable shorts starring A.A. A. Milne's Winnie the Pooh character. The Soviet version is much different in both style and content from the Disney versions that were oh. also being made starting in the 1960s. As opposed to the polished Disney films, the environments look like they were drawn by children, and the shorts have an intentionally crude look. Also around this time, two icons of Soviet animation, Cheburashka and Gaina the Crocodile, hit screens in 1969. Roman Kachanov directed a puppet stop-motion short adapted from books by Russian author Edward Uspensky and three follow-up shorts in the 70s and 80s. The characters have become extremely famous, and Cheburashka was the mascot for the Russian Olympic team multiple times. There was even an anime version made starting in 2009. There what? was lots of memorable children's animation in this era, like the work of Vladimir Popov, in 1969, he directed Umka, a short about polar bears, and in 1978, created the iconic Three from Prostok Vashino, based on children's books. Inessa Kovalevskaya directed musical shorts in the late 60s and 70s, like Town Musicians oh, of Bremen. Oh, I've seen that one as well. Lion and Turtle sang a song. Um, there were even Soviet of, uh, versions of The Little Mermaid, the Bremen musicians, there we go. and Cinderella in the 60s and 70s. One of the most unique animators to start out in the 1970s was Vladimir Tarasov, who mostly made trippy, colorful science fiction shorts. He shows a clear influence from psychedelic animation like the 1968 Beatles film Yellow Submarine, and the titular vessel even makes an appearance in Tarasov's early 10-minute film called The Mirror of Time. This was Tarasov's first time making science fiction, and it includes space and time travel. In 1978, Tarasov made Contact, a psychedelic dialogue-free short about a man meeting a shape-shifting alien. Two years later, he made The Return, another trippy short, this time about a cosmonaut returning to Earth. A decent amount of animated sci-fi was made in the USSR during the 70s and 80s, and it was pretty varied in terms of style and content. A very intriguing sci-fi short is Anatoly Petrov's Firing Range, a 1977 anti-war film about a tank that destroys targets after reading their minds oh. and detecting hostility. The story becomes even more relevant today as technology advances and experimentation with autonomous weapons increases. Firing Range has a unique realistic style 
coming from an unusual technique using two layers of celluloid to create depth. A much more light-hearted sci-fi oh. film is Roman Kochanov's Mystery of the Third Planet. I've seen this one as well. It features space travel and colorful and surreal imagery with bizarre backgrounds and aliens. It was a good film. There's even some animated science fiction out of Belarus in the shorts of Lev Shukalyukov. Given that we know Soviet animation was well-received in Japan, it wouldn't surprise me if this wave of science fiction influenced anime creators of the era. Perhaps the most sense, acclaimed yeah. Soviet animator of the 70s was Yuri Norshin, who got his start working for directors like Ivan I've seen this one as well. Kidruk. With his wife Francesca Yarusova, they created a device using multiple layers of glass to create interesting three-dimensional effects. They made poetic, lyrical works that were mainly about animals on the surface, but had allegorical resonance. Norstein's Hedgehog in the Fog from 1977 was not only one of the best Soviet animated films, but is considered among the best in all of animation history. It used cardboard cutouts and was meticulously made, with the perfectionism most noticeable in the extremely realistic fog effects. The short has become iconic, appearing on Russian stamps and getting mentioned in the 2014 Winter Olympics opening ceremony. Miyazaki what? was a fan of Hedgehog in the Fog, and the Studio Ghibli Museum in Japan hosted an exhibition of Norstein's films in the 2000s. Also oh. lauded as an all-time great is his follow-up, Tale of Tales, which is autobiographical and inspired by Norstein's childhood and family. The enigmatic film is about post-World War II Soviet society, and although it is about humans, it's seen through the eyes of a sad little wolf. Tale of Tales is non-linear and doesn't tell a straightforward story, and also contains some impressive depth effects. In these decades, Soviet animation began to expand more outside of Russia. Armenian Robert Sokyanitz directed shorts with stories and fairy tales from Armenia's national poet Hovanas Tumanyan and other Armenian writers as source material. Oh wow! Estonian How Ryan Ramat made materials. short films like his violent, surreal 1983 Surtol about a mythical Estonian giant. Edward Nazarov's Once Upon a Time There Lived a Dog was made by Soyuz Mold Film, but in Ukraine. It originated from a Ukrainian folktale and uses Ukrainian folk songs. The final era to cover spans from the end of Brezhnev's tenure as General Secretary in 1982 to the fall of the Soviet Union, a multi-year process that ended in 1991. Not many popular animated features were made during this period. However, there were certainly new filmmakers coming along making some interesting animated shorts, like Gary Bardeen, who made stop motion using everyday objects. For example, he used matches in a 1983 short conflict where the matches act out a military engagement. Oh, Similarly, in Bardeen's short clever. banquet, we see a dinner party with invisible guests where utensils and food appear to move on their own. In his twists and turns, a wire coils itself into a man who then uses the rest of the wire to create a garden, house, and wife. There Will Come Soft Rains is a dark short film from Uzbekistan based on a short story by Ray Bradbury, a legendary author from the golden age of science fiction. It's a dark, depressing tale of an automated robot going about its routine the day after a nuclear apocalypse. Mikhail Titov made short films in Ukraine, like Meeting, about aliens and UFOs, and Battle, where he uses rotoscoping to adapt a Stephen King short story where toy what? soldiers come to life and attack their designer. I've seen Older this. filmmakers were also putting out plenty of quality shorts. In 1984, Keetrick released his final film as director and one of his most serious, the anti-war parable The Lion and the Ox. It has no dialogue and represents the Cold War, with the title characters standing in for the U.S. and Soviet Union. In 1987, Robert Sakyanitz made a surreal sci-fi short called Lesson, with lots of nudity and sexual content, and music from Herbie Hancock. Tarasov continued making sci-fi shorts as well, like Contract, where a space colonist is saved from alien monsters by a robot. Contract has an anti-capitalist message and features greedy corporate bosses. The Past from 1988 is Tarasov's longest and one of his darkest, about a family who survived a spaceship crash on an alien world. Since this is a video about cinema, and partly just not to make this video super long, I excluded animation for television. However, oh. I will just quickly mention a couple examples, like the Well Just You Wait series that started in 1969, and the work of Alexander Tatarsky, 
So there's still more that he hasn't covered yet? Surprisingly, a ton of the films I mentioned, even the feature-length ones, are on YouTube to watch for free and even have English subtitles. This has been just a tiny dip into the incredibly rich and varied world of Soviet animation. So if there are any specific filmmakers or eras you'd like to see a video on, let me know in the comments. That's all, right. all for this video. Thanks for watching, and please don't forget to subscribe. Guys, this was a video by A Beginner's Guide to Soviet Animated Cinema by Kubrick, Kubrick Lynch Film History. Go give him a uh, go give him a like and a comment and subscribe. What do you guys think of the information given? I um, I was surprised the whole day, the whole way through. You know, I thought Japan was like you know the epitome of animation. Turns out these guys. Like the Studio Ghibli people were inspired by Russian or Soviet cartoonist. That's wild. I never knew you guys were ahead, like ahead of the, the curve. You guys literally almost invented this. Wow. But yeah, guys, if you see any of these films, if you, say, if you find any of them that are English subtitled and free in YouTube, I'll start watching them and posting them. Let me know in the comments, man. Did you guys learn anything? Is this valid? Come on. Leave a leave a message in the comment. Alright, guys. Like, comment, and subscribe. Peace.